we want to welcome you to our midweek service. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 5 as we continue walk through the Old Testament and uh, Samuel this week, chapter 5. And as we go to prayer, we do want to uh, remember this, this Big Creek fire and uh, it affected a lot of people um, in our church family, uh, Joe Marie, uh, George, you would know. Uh, her, um, they've evacuated from where they were. Uh, Frank and Amy Heinrich have evacuated, and a lot of the uh, cattle that, that Frank is responsible for are up there, especially in the fire area. And that's very, uh, um, this is a bad thing. It's a bad situation. And just pray for that. Pray also for uh, Dave and Karen Heinrich, and they have a little uh, cabin up near Oakhurst. And so that's kind of in that range also. And just pray for Oakhurst and for the Eworts. They were on evacuation warning, if you remember the Eworts from our <clears throat> family. So it just affected a lot. And others, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure have the, the same thing. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to pray, Lord, for those that are being affected by this uh, incredible fire uh, up there in the Madera County, Fresno area. And we just pray for... Um, Frank and Amy, we want to pray, Lord, for Joe Marie. We want to pray, I'm sorry, for Jessica, Lord. And we want to pray, Lord, for Heinrichs and, and others, uh, Lord, that are being affected by this. Pray that you protect their properties and livestock and all of the things, Lord, that are going on. And we just ask your hand to be on that fire. Lord, put it out, Lord, with your incredible, miraculous breath. As we go into your word today, I pray that we would be uh, blessed and encouraged by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, first Samuel chapter five and first family, the, the story of Samuel. And he was a, a young man that was uh, given to his mother, Hannah, as a miracle of God and an answer to her prayer. And her promise was to give him back to God in service. And he was trained under the leadership of Eli. And we know that the word of God is rare in those days. And so last week, we saw Eli and his sons who were um, killed uh, in a battle, and the ark of God was taken uh, by the Philistines. And so in this chapter, it's a, it's a small chapter, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. It'll be a little shorter message this week. Uh, but uh, the implications in our current culture and cultures throughout the history of mankind of, of what are you going to do with God once you know that he is real, once you see that he exists, how are you going to respond to him? And the fact that God doesn't really, that we're, while we are privileged to be a part of the work of God, he can certainly do it with or without us. So let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. The Philistines took the ark of God, brought it, uh, from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So this Dagon is this Philistine god. He's been uh, referred to as the god of agriculture. And this Dagon, it's, it's uh, thought to be uh, the torso and head of a man, and the, the bottom is part of of a fish, uh, might be like a merman, uh, but it kind of represents the, the sustenance of the earth and they would rely on it uh, to provide for them, whether it's their fish. Uh, the word Dagon um, kind of comes from a word that, that is uh, translated to corn or grain. So they looked upon this God to meet their needs. And, and kind of, it was interesting to me, that man is is obsessed with someone meeting their needs. We saw that when Jesus fed the 5,000. The response of the people was they wanted to force him to be their king. Uh, why? Well, because he could heal them. And he had shown that. And so, whoa, that's the best health care you could possibly get. And he could feed them with just a couple of fish and loaves of bread. And, and Jesus responded to the 5,000 
uh, of the, you're looking at this all physically. He says, if you really want to be saved, you need to eat my flesh and drink of my blood. You have to be saved. But they were only concerned with their physical sustenance. And so it's interesting that the God of these Philistines was the, that they held in such high regard uh, was a God of sustenance. And I think that's still true today. Uh, we are looking at our politicians and they have honed into this idea that if we just promise you sustenance and scare you to think that the other side is taking your sustenance away, uh, we will vote for those who give us stuff. We want free stuff. And, and we need to focus on the spiritual and, and all of these gods, even in the Egypts of, of the plagues, so many of the plagues represented the, the God of the Nile, the, this other sun God. Again, those that bring them water and warmth and physical sustenance. When God wants to give you spiritual sustenance. Um, we do see Dagon in a couple other places in, in Scripture. Uh, Judges 16.33, after they had captured Samson and with the help of Delilah, it says this, The lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our god has delivered in our hands Samson, our enemy. Well, they wouldn't be alive here much longer, so while Dagon in their eyes, brought them Samson. Samson brought them destruction when he pulled the pillars of the temple down. And these same people that praised Dagon were not saved by Dagon. And our culture is the same way. We rely on all kinds of um, gods and all kinds of things. First Chronicles 10.10, 10, um, they took the head of Saul when, when King Saul had died. The Philistines took it and it says they... They put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. So they took Saul, 1 Corinthians 10. So this was the main Philistine god. And they took this ark of God, the representation of God's power. And the Philistines are feeling pretty good right now. They've got, they had this victory and they were able to take the ark of God. Well, why wouldn't God just strike them dead when they touched the ark? Uh, they, and, and basically... He's going to teach them this lesson, but but too much is given, much is required, you know. And and uh, I, I, God doesn't hold them as responsible for the holy things, but He's going to. And so they take this ark and they place it under this Dagon to represent the fact that Dagon is more powerful than the God of Israel. Well, that's not true. What they don't understand is that their God is using them and manipulating them to bring judgment on his people. Uh, but God is going to show them that he still rules. And this is where we are today. Our nation may be under judgment because of the immoralities and the separation of church and state. Um, but remember, it's God's people called by his name that are going to either bring judgment or revival. Um, so we look at uh, verse 3 and 4, and it says, um, When they arose in early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Let's go to verse 3. Uh, verse 3 says, When the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. So in verse 3, they get up, they go to the temple, and Dagon is fallen prostrate in, in the place of worship to this ark. And so they, they didn't think much of it. And they thought, oh, man. And it's a miracle. I mean, how did it fall, this, this god? And so they have to lift it up. And that's the difference between a man-made God and a God. God lifts us up. Man-made God has to be lifted up by their people. You know, God mocked some of the tree idols of, of 
the enemies of God by saying, you know, you, you can't even, they can't even move without you picking them up, cutting them down and bringing them. Our God doesn't need us to lift him up. He lifts us up. And so then in verse four, we read that they rose early in the morning and there was Dagon again fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. But the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. And uh, that was one Dagon. I, I think it's pronounced Dagon, but I always say Dagon because um, that was one of my dad's favorite words is daggone thing can't work i can't get these daggone things together and so when i look at this god of the philistines it's like this daggone god of theirs um and now the second day they go and, and god ramps up his his revelation of his power by taking this god of theirs and not only bringing it into this place of worship but taking off his hands and his head. And, and that was often a symbol uh, throughout scripture when David took the head of Goliath of victory and of, of rule um, and kings would have their hands cut off their heads and things like that. Um, so what are they going to do now? God has shown them that there's something about this ark. The minute they brought this thing into the temple of Dagon, he fell and worshiped it. And then the next day, his hands and his head are broken. And so obviously, what would you do if you're truly seeking truth? Then you would see that God is powerful. The God of Israel is the true God. That's not what they do. Verse 5, therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashton to this day. They just stop going. And that was their response to it. You know what? Ugh, we're not going in there anymore. There's some weird things going on in there. We're just going to stay away from it. And, and that's what kind of we rely on. There is this superstition that, that we ought not to go there. And too many people treat Christianity or God with a superstitious attitude. And, and I, I'm not... Um, uh, this might offend you, I don't know, uh, but if we're relying on little trinkets and beads and, and those kind of things as, as having power, the power is in God himself. Even this box, it's just a box, this ark, but it represents the power of God. And they're looking at, even Israel saw this box as superstitious. Remember, they thought if they brought it out, they'd have victory. And so again, if you've got nothing wrong with you, you have a cross as a reminder. You know, we we drink the cup of juice as a reminder of the blood of Christ and eat the cracker as a reminder of the broken body. Um, but there's no uh, powers within the cracker or the juice. The power is God Himself, and we have our own rituals, baptism, Lord's Supper, which are pictures and reminders and testimonies of what God's done for us. Um, but we do the same thing. We, we begin to treat them a little bit like, like an idol, like a trinket, like a superstition. And uh, we've got to be careful not to do that. All right. And, and religion is a relationship. Our Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. While religion is a, is a tradition of, of rituals and trinkets and other things like that. And we've got to be careful not to, uh, to turn that. It's, it's just a human nature thing. All of these um, religions have that kind of a thing, that kind of ritual, that kind of um, magical, mystical thing. And Christ is a relationship. It's a real person. Um, so once they're shown the power of God, their response to it is to just stay away. And isn't that the response of people today? I don't do anything religious. I don't really go to church. I don't want nothing to do with God. Every knee will uh, bow. Every tongue will confess. Um, verse 6 says, The hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And that the word tumors is emeralds. Uh, we got our word hemorrhoids from that. 
Uh, so these were boils and, and some type of a plague. And we're going to see next week that it, it may have something to do with rats. That's a traditional thought process. Um, but what we do see here is the hands of Dagon are cut off, but the hands of God are fallen on the people. So the hands of God are great, you know, and it's the old Jonathan Edwards sermon, you know, and, and it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And this is where our nation is headed. Now, I believe that I'll be protected. In fact, I know I will. Even if my life is taken by some type of anti-Christian sentiment, um, I'll be absent with the body, present with the Lord. So I know that that um, that I'm protected, just as Israel was during the plagues of, of Egypt. The death angel passed over them. Um, but the, here, God is is trying to show these Philistines that what they've got in this in this ark of God is dangerous to them. They shouldn't have it, or they should turn to the God that. First bows down Dagon, then cuts off his hands, and now they are are plagued with these boils, and uh, it just gets worse and worse until people turn to God. And in our nation, that's good news uh, because we are seeing the realm of people turning back to God. And who knows what revival God may bring or judgment God may bring? Uh, verse seven and eight says, "When the men of Ashdod saw how it was." They said, the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh towards us, and Dagon are gone. They know what's going on. And people manifest within them that God is going on, and they can see the judgment of God. They can see where our country was when we were following Christ and following one nation under God, the blessings that came. They still don't want those blessings. Verse 8, Therefore they sent and gathered them to themselves, all the lords of the Philistines, and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away, and they said, Man, we don't want anything to do with this God. Get rid of it. Because men prefer darkness rather than light, and they'd rather have this thing gone and give it to somebody else. And, and, but they know that's the amazing thing. They know that it is a God of Israel doing these things. And they admit that they, they acknowledge that he is more powerful than their false fake God. But do they turn to him? No. And that's what happens today. The world prefers darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So marvel not that the world hates you. They hate this God. You're mad at this God. All they're going to do is bow to him repent like the Ninevites did when Jonah went to them, but they refused to do so. And because of that, the plagues will continue. So their answer, one, was superstition, and two, was just to get rid of it altogether. We don't want religion, separation of church and state. We don't want Jesus in our country. We don't want to look. No, I want to hear it. And if we just remain in darkness, and when we get to God, we can just tell we didn't know. Well, that doesn't work. Mass without excuse. And so the last few verses, they just play a little thing of, of passing the buck from, from nation to nation. Verse 9, it was when they carried it away, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the main city, both small and great. And tumors broke out on them, or emeralds, or, or plagues, or boils. Therefore, verse 10, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. So Gas didn't like it, they sent it to Ekron. So it was the ark of God came to Ekron, and the Ekronites cried out, saying, they brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. We don't want that thing. So they sent and gathered together the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God to Israel. Let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there is a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God it was very heavy there. They know it's the hand of God. And that's the same today. If you don't think that people know, know that, that they are suffering uh, the penalty for their sins and the wrath and punishment of God, they know it. It's coming. And the men who did not die were stricken with tumors in the city. Went, uh, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. What are they crying out? 
And this is what happens with people. They don't follow God. Their life falls apart. And they call a pastor and say, oh, can you help me? We're struggling with all our finances. And we're struggling with my help. I'm addicted to this and I'm addicted to it. And you say, well, if you turn, oh, I'm not religious, but I just want help. Can you help us? Our relative has passed away and we, we don't know who to turn to. And could you speak? But don't talk about God. And, and, and we, we don't really believe in that superstitious stuff. We don't believe in God. But they know. They reach out to a preacher. They reach out to a pastor. They reach out to a Christian friend. But when you bring salvation in it, they don't want that. They just want you to fix things without a relationship with Christ. And Christ loves us too much to allow us to be blessed and succeed without salvation because our souls are important to him. He loved us so much, he sent his only son to die for us that we might have eternal life. And he will not allow us to wallow in darkness for he is the light of the world. God is trying to draw his, his people uh, by love and judgment. Second Corinthians 2, 15 and 16 says, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, we are the death. We are the aroma of, of death leading to death. To the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? So God says we as believers are an aroma. To, to Christians, an aroma of life or to those who come to Christ. But to those who won't come to him, it's an aroma of death. And the Bible calls the message of God bittersweet. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll close with these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Revelations 10, 9, and 10. When they ate the book of God that was judgment, it was bittersweet. See, the message of God is sweet to Christians, but it's bitter to non-Christians. And, and these followers of Dagon, all they had to do was turn away from Dagon and turn to the God who they knew was bringing destruction but they wouldn't do it. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? And he made foolish the Philistines' God. He, got, and he made him bow down to his ark twice and then broke his hands. Their response? Stay away from that place. God's there might punish us. Look at verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God said, you know what? This gospel, it's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's foolishness to the Greeks. But to us, it is beautiful power of God and the wisdom of God. And that's the message. It always has been. It, it is the, the message of salvation that the Philistines rejected and that the world rejects today. So what do we do? We keep preaching. It, it feels foolish sometimes, and it's like, I know nobody's listening, but we continue to bring the message of the gospel, and it will be the sweet smell of life to those who will eventually accept it. And that's the beauty of it. Another thing is, it's once we preach it, this, this ark was in a place where there were no people to witness of God, no people to talk about God. And yet, God was able to get his message across without anybody there to help him. And that's still true today. But don't you want to be a part of it, a part of spreading this message, a part of reaching the people for the gospel? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We just pray, Lord, as we take the light of the gospel to a darkened world that prefer darkness rather than light, we understand that it's not going to be easy or it will be difficult. 
and people will find every excuse. They'll turn to superstition, they'll turn to trinkets, they'll turn to religious traditions, and they'll turn to all kinds of different ceremonial things while rejecting the truth of the gospel that's been ingrained in them to know it's real. Lord, I pray, God, you would help the seeds of the gospel to fall on good ground. If anybody's listening to this message, <clears throat> much of it might be offensive to them, and yet, Lord, it is your truth, and I think you will show that to them. You don't need me. You don't need me to convince or, or, or uh, force anyone to trust in this. Lord, the Holy Spirit will do the work. We pray that it does in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Continue to pray for those that are affected by the fire. We will have a morning live service, 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. Hope you can join us. Have a blessed week.